So indeed, what are the consequences of not obeying the command to defend the faith? Every Christian's duty. Some may not uh, think that, but that's what it says. What inevitably happens when the false doctrine of any contending is prevalent in the local church is that false doctrines, which are inevitably held by immature believers, are permitted to prevail without challenge blocking the spiritual growth of individuals and the local body, church body itself. So with, even within the body, you have to speak up. The pastor, teacher, and elders can only do so much, and if they themselves hold the false doctrines and teach the false doctrines that believers are not permitted to argue in defense of the faith, then the local body is susceptible to heresies of all kind, even from the pulpit. More mature believers will thus be silenced if they wish to remain in that local body, or they will move out to another local church, devoiding it of its capacity, by and large, to grow. The pastor can't do it all. And if he's, done it, if he's going against that, you're going to have a, uh, a heresy. You don't have a Christian body there at all. If they teach lordship salvation, we're done. This leaves a local church with only an immature body of believers, and even non-believers who profess heretical doctrines unchallenged. That's the first thing you notice when people are all of one accord in terms of being quiet and letting the pastor dictate what they think, say, and do. There's a problem there. You don't have a lot of immature and mature and, uh, and everybody in between believers in the body of Christ. Something's missing. For example, experiences which do not line up with biblical guidelines, such as perfect experiential holiness of the believer, modern-day tongues and prayer language, prophecy, Word of knowledge and other kinds of miracles are proclaimed unchallenged as authentic and the main focus of the Christian life, ignoring the apparent violations of rules stipulated for these experiences in the Bible and the unwarranted emphasis on these experiences, which even if real, should not be the top priority of the Christian life. Just take a look at 1 Corinthians. Thus the immature believer and the local church body itself is sidetracked from God's plan for his life, often declining into heretical extremes. So, to continue, we've thoroughly investigated defending the faith. Now, what about the believer taking up his cross? Is that going to be suicidal as well? Am I going to be banned from that in the various churches that I might attend? A faithful Christian is one who is walking under persecution and testing. The cross prepared specifically for him to carry. I'm not looking for it, but you're going to get it by being faithful. Scripture indicates that by being faithful, a faithful ambassador of Jesus Christ, 2 Cor 5.20, a believer will often be slandered, reviled, and undergo other kinds of suffering. A believer is God's emissary on earth. Who else is going to remain? If you're not part of the body of Christ, who else is going to represent God? An ambassador of the Lord Jesus Christ, through whom God makes his appeal to mankind, of the way to have eternal life with him in heaven and the way mankind is to conduct himself on earth. God makes his appeal through the believer when the believer testifies to others with his mouth as to what God has said in his word. And here is 2 Corinthians 5.20. We believers are therefore Christ's ambassadors as though God were working, his, making his appeal through us. When Christ isn't here physically presenting his gospel, which he hasn't been for 2,000 years nearly, Who's supposed to represent him? We are. If, he's, if we speak up and don't speak up, then there's nobody. So God's appeal is not just one of exemplary behavior, but one of being an active witness of what God has said in his word relative to all matters, even business matters, even at the workplace. And this will result in difficulty, conflict, and sacrifice. When you think about your job, more than you think about being a Christian, why is that an end? Now, you don't go ahead and disrupt the working community by uh, interrupting people in a conversation and declaring the, the gospel. You know, there, are, there are ways to do that and, and still do your job effectively. Luke 9, 23. Then he, Jesus, said to them all, If anyone would come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. We get an idea what that cross is. An individual is not just called in this life to trust alone in Christ alone, unto eternal life, after his eternal destiny is secured by faith and sealed unto the day of his redemption by the Holy Spirit, a believer is required to deny his own personal pursuits and take up his cross daily and follow the Lord Jesus Christ. The believer has duties to perform. 
Here's Ephesians 2.10. What did Ephesians 2.8.9 say? For by grace you have been saved unto eternal life through faith. And that salvation is not of yourselves. It's the gift of God, not by works, lest any man should boast. But then 2.10 follows. For we, believers, are his workmanship now. Once we believe and got saved unto eternal life, we're his workmanship, and we're our, we're our workmanship is created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them when we just read some of those. This verse indicates that a believer has certain unique tasks to perform which God designed specifically for each individual believer to do before the foundation of the universe was formed, before all creation. A.W. Tozer in The Best of Tozer stated, True spirituality manifests itself in the desire to be holy rather than happy. Let me say that again. True spirituality manifests itself in the desire to be holy rather than happy. The spiritual man wants to carry his cross. Many Christians accept adversity or tribulation with a sigh and call it their cross, forgetting that such things come alike to saint and sinner. The cross, the cross is that extra adversity that comes to us as a result of our obedience to Christ. This cross is not forced upon us. We voluntarily take it up with full knowledge of the consequences. The more you study the Bible, that's why a lot of people don't want to study the Bible with me. You go into such great depth, I think they think, well, the more you know, the more you're going to have to explain, the more you can explain, the more suffering you're going to have to do. We choose to obey Christ, and by so doing, choose to carry the cross. Not going to be easy. Carry a cross means to be attached to the person of Christ, committed to the Lordship of Christ in their life, and obedient to the commands of Christ. Does that sound like I'm a Lordship Salvationist? In the best sense, I'm, a, I'm saved, and I want to show people that I'm saved by grace through faith, and I'll show that by declaring what the gospel is. It's by grace through faith, and not persevering in the faith, yet I'm going to have adversity, and people will see that perhaps. Maybe be the ones that attack me. I've been physically attacked by any number of Lordship Salvationists that say you have to persevere in the faith, and I say, I think it's saved by grace. And the guy stomach bumped me, bumped me, and kept bumping me, and said, leave. He wants me to leave the entire Balboa Park of San Diego because he doesn't like me there. He doesn't even own the park, and it's the second largest inner city park in the world. Such a man would rather be useful than famous, and would rather serve than be served. And this must be by the operation of the Holy Spirit within him. No man can become spiritual by himself. Case closed? Well, that's the message opposite, opposing to the therapist giving me the other day. Let's, let's look at that again and see what that was. Uh, I can go here. Let me go here. Keep in mind what this was, what this conversation was, and he says, I don't want to talk to you anymore. Because I'm suicidal. I'm self-destructive. He called 911 on me. He sent the cops to Walmart while I was talking to him on the phone long distance and getting his uh, voice and input. I'm not permitted to speak to others about Jesus if it causes never get a reaction. Give it up. My faith in Christ hardly any follow you. We had Jesus ended up with only 12. I have a death wish. I'm suicidal. And he said, do you really want to become a martyr or harm yourself? And then he says, all the violence, negative reactions toward you, you are the cause. Yeah, a lot of times I am in the sense of instigating what people are not going to want to hear, but I don't know if they're going to react that way. Most of them will, but it's not my job. Jesus didn't not talk to people because he knew the reaction would be negative or, or, or melt down his, or, or whittle down his message so he wouldn't offend everybody. Well, I'll stop being you. Just like telling Jesus, stop being... I can't stop being a Christian. I can be a quiet Christian. Jesus was never quiet. I need an attitude change. I try something more socially acceptable. Like I said to him, I said, well, which would you like? Excessive drinking? Um, violence? Should I rob some banks? Social... Oh, no. Nah, you know, socially acceptable. Uh, all kinds of, of non-temporal, non-permanent things? No. I don't think so. Well, anyway, let's go back. Who do I obey, by the way? Do I obey the therapist or do I obey Jesus? Seek opportunities. A Christian is to seek out opportunities to represent Jesus, not only just 
answer when somebody asks you. People go, oh yeah, wait till I ask you. They're not going to ask you anything. They're going to have their own point of view. If they don't, they're not Christian, they're not going to ask you, what does it take to be a Christian? You have everybody come up there and, and tug on your shoulder saying, hey, what does it take to be a Christian? It's hardly happened to me at all, maybe once. And somebody else prompted to go up and ask me because I was better informed. Objector to a Christian testimony claim that Jesus never sought people out, that people always came to him in earnest to learn truth from God's word. They claim that our Lord was never direct or firm in his matter, nor toward others when he spoke of truth from God's word and that he never offended anyone. Scripture says otherwise. Jesus sought out those who were lost. He didn't wait until people sought him out. Luke 19, 9-10, Ju Jesus said to him, Zacharias, Zacchaeus, the tax collector, today, and he was not a well-liked person, tax collectors, today salvation has come to this house because this man too is the son of Abraham. For the son of man came to seek and to save what was lost. You don't think he did, knew that he was going to try to convert uh, Zacchaeus? And he did. Jesus sought, in Matthew 4, sought out Peter, Andrew, James, John, and Matthew. As Jesus was walking beside the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon called Peter, and his brother Andrew. They were casting a net into the lake, for they were fishermen. Notice that Peter and Andrew were busy fishing. They were not seeking after our Lord, tugging on his uh, shoulder, saying, what, can you, can you tell me what, what you're all about. He sought after them. Come, follow me, Jesus said, and I will make you fishers of men. And once they left their nets and followed him. Going on from there, he saw two other brothers, James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John. They were in a boat with their father Zebedee, preparing their nets. Jesus called them. And immediately they left the boat and their father and followed him. As Jesus went on from there, he saw a man named Matthew sitting at the tax collector's booth. Follow me, he told me, and Matthew got up and followed him. And our Lord often went directly to the synagogue in each town that he visited in order to instruct others. You know how successful he was? The first time he did that, they tried to push him off a mountain without being first asked or even approached. He just went to the synagogue. And oftentimes, the common practice in the synagogue was for an individual to voluntarily stand up and read a portion of Scripture and make a comment. And that's what he did. Matthew 4.23, Jesus went throughout Galilee, teaching in the synagogues, preaching the good news of the kingdom and healing every disease and sickness among the people. You don't think that was a message? Come gather to me, but I'm going to send you a sign. And they came to him. And Jesus was often aggressive in seeking out an audience. Let's see. Let's look at that comment, by the way. Luke 4, 14 to 21. Interesting. Matthew, Matthew 5, 15, 10. Jesus called the crowd to him and said, Listen and understand. He was aggressive. Let's read that. Luke 4, 14 to 21. So as it opens up. Unlocking books. This is a great uh, resource. It's no longer available. But you might be able to get something similar in Logos, but it's not so well put together. What was it? Luke 14, 4, 14 to 21. Luke 4, that's in the New Testament, right? 4. Actually, it's not in a, a New Testament book, though. It's not a book about the New Covenant with Israel. And it still has first century Israel in mind. The uh, church doctrines are in the epistles, right? So, Paul 14. And Jesus returned to Galilee in the power of the Spirit. The perfect humanity of Jesus Christ in his humanity utilized the power of the Spirit within him and not his deity, and knows about him spread all through all the surrounding district, and he began teaching in their synagogues and praised by all. It's pretty aggressive. He goes there, and if you raise your hand, you'll get the book to read from, and he select your own passage. And he came to Nazareth, uh-oh, where he had been brought up, uh-oh, and as was his cousin, custom, he entered the synagogue on the Sabbath and stood up to read. And you can read. A lot of times that went on for a while. And they would bring you a scroll and you could read to pick the one you want. And the book of the prophet Isaiah was handed to him. And he opened the book and found the place where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim, release the kit to the, to the captives, and recovery of sight to the blind, and set free those who are oppressed to proclaim the favorable year of the Lord. Hey, you haven't finished the, set, the, the passage yet. Yeah. And he closed the book and gave it to back to the attendant and sat down in the eyes of all the synagogues.